morning, church. Come on, stand up. Sing this together. When all I see, when all I see is a battle, but you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. That's how we fight. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that all belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, that all belongs to you. Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Oh, when all I see is a cross, oh God, you see.
Good morning, church. I'm here with a very special young lady, one of my good friends, Miss Bella Stucker. I've been blessed enough to have her through preschool and early childhood. And today I get to baptize her. Bella's parents reached out a few weeks ago and Jenny was like, what was that? And I'm like, yes, I don't get to do this very often. So especially for somebody that I love so much. So. Bella, you've talked to and went through class with Miss Tiffany, and now today we're going to do the public side of this where we're going to do a confession of faith. Okay? So you just repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. Who died for my sins. Who died for my sins. And the gift of eternal life. And the gift of eternal life. Because of this public confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That never gets old, does it, church? You guys, go ahead and have a seat. I'm so glad you guys are here today. Uh, it's, it's already a treat, right? It, we, it's already a treat. That's the celebration in and of itself. Uh, but I'm so excited that you guys are here today. Um, I want to let you know some new faces that you're going to see. Uh, let me start already up on stage joining us and helping out. This is Joel uh, and Riley. And Riley's, yeah, there you go, yeah. Come on, somebody other than the South Carolina crew, welcome, all right? 
Riley's dad's going to preach, and it's uh, Joel's uncle, and so we're glad. I love these guys and love having them. And then my man, Matt, over here uh, from uh, Conway, South Carolina, Ecclesia Christian Church. They're doing incredible stuff. If you guys go to Myrtle Beach on vacation and you're there on the weekend, it's on the 501. You can't miss it. You need to go. That's where you need to worship uh, when you're in Myrtle Beach. And so the rest of the the rest of the tribe is right over here. And so welcome them. Uh, they're really easy to find. They're blonde and got tans. And so, uh, so we're glad. We're so glad you guys are here. It's been an incredible weekend already. I mean, God is doing so many incredible things. We were up here yesterday, and uh, our soccer started, and there's hundreds of people up here yesterday. Little kids running around playing soccer. At the youngest level, it's kind of like amoeba ball. They all just run in groups. And, and every once in a while, one of them actually kicks the ball. And it's amazing, but they're all up here just having fun. And, and then I know last night there was a, a marriage uh, cookout and a bunch of couples that were just there enjoying their marriage and enjoying being with other people. Uh, and just so many things that were happening up here. And, and I was sitting up here uh, with Matt yesterday while he was doing something. I was just sitting over by myself and thinking, God, you're doing so many cool things. And we are so blessed at what's happening on the hill. And we just sang about how Jesus over, overcame. There's an empty grave. That's why we do what we're about to do. I love that every week we take, we take some time just to remember that. And, and then we take time to remember what Jesus did. And that as we do it, that we remember that he overcame for us. He overcame sin for us. He overcame the grave so that we don't have to be afraid of death. And so this morning, if you didn't already do so, uh, when after I pray and the band will be playing, you can get up and come to one of the, any of the communion stations. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, the cups are double stacked. And, and so the bottom, you just grab one set, and the bottom cup's got a little piece of bread uh, that we take to remember Jesus' body. And then there's the cup with the juice, and we remember his blood. And how he freely gave both of them so that we could have eternity and that we could be with him. And, and so you can just come and uh, any time during the song, you can come and get, a, uh, get your emblems if you haven't already done so. Have your, your own additional prayer and just partake. Don't forget that at every one of the communion stations, there's all, also the offering boxes. And, and I'm, I'm somewhat hesitant to say this because sometimes it backfires, but you guys are doing phenomenal. In the midst of a pandemic, to see giving going the way that it's going is amazing. Don't stop. Don't stop. Because some of the guys tell me every time I say that, you stop. So don't stop. But that's part of what we do to worship, too. To say, God, because you overcame, I believe in this. I believe in this so much I want to make Jesus famous around the world. And so I'm going to give to my local church so that all these flags that represent the countries where we got boots on the ground, people that are sharing the gospel, so that we can remember Joe and Ashley, our missionaries that are in Italy, so that we can remember Luke, who's now located on the field in Guatemala. And part of our tithes and offerings every week go to make those things possible. That's part of our worship. Don't ever lose sight of that. So right now, let's just, uh, let's just pray and have a time to reflect on how awesome it is that Jesus overcame for us. God, thanks for loving us enough to give us Jesus, who did not consider his equality with you something to be grasped and held on to, but humbled himself and became a servant, came to this earth, lived a humble life, even to the point of death. But death couldn't hold him. And we celebrate that today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a beautiful, beautiful name it is. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Come on, church, we declare this today. Death could not hold you, the veil torn before you. You silence the boasts of sin and death. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your Y'all can grab a seat. What is up, Shelby Christian? How you guys doing? I get it, 8.30 service. <laughs> you know, everywhere you go, it's, everybody's like, oh, it's the 8.30 service. And, and the truth of it is, we put, when we started our church, we had the most dynamic 8.30 service ever. There was like three people in it. And it, it was like in the third year of our church, so our church is almost seven years old. And in the third year of our church, it sounds like something biblical, in the third year of the ecclesia, we decided we got to start just a service for those that are serving. And there was like this small group of us, but they were just mm, great. Then we started growing and started growing. And so the, now our 830 service was growing and it was dynamic. It was passionate. It was powerful. Then we built a building and we moved in and all these new people came. And it went like every church in America, 830 service. People were like, yeah, praise Jesus. <laughs> just kind of one of those things. Like, I always heard people are like, oh, I'm a morning person. I'm a morning person. Not at 830 at church, they're not. Because there's something about this is, this is that reserved service, but we can change that. I think today, this can be the service that all other services look up to and like, those guys are crazy. You know what I mean? I think the 10 o'clock service today should hear legends of what the 830 service was like this morning. Are y'all with me on that? All right, all seven people there with me. I'm going to be preaching for y'all this morning. All right, the rest of you guys, enjoy your coffee. You need it. Okay, so you guys, have been, you guys have been blazing through my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Acts. 
I'm going to tell you the truth. People ask us all the time, where, do you, where does Ecclesia learn to do what they're doing? The book of Acts. The book of Acts is everything. Um, that, and we copy people like Dave. Um, like whenever Dave comes, he thinks he's just breathing into me, but I'm stealing everything he tells me. I'm just, I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. We'll do that too. Yeah. Dave comes to visit. He's like, this is so familiar. I'm like, it should be. We stole it. But and I, I got to share with you guys something about the book of Acts. We, you guys know today we're looking at obstacles and how we grow through them. A couple things. Not everybody in the modern church today believes growth is a good thing, although that is the requirement of God for his kingdom. That is the great commission. First command God gave his people. Go, multiply. Every married couple in here, you should be happy about that one. <laughs> Think about it. Stew on it a little bit. That's why I got seven kids. I'm obedient to the Lord. But go, multiply, subdue the earth. Then he floods the earth. They come off the ark. First command, go, multiply, subdue the earth. Jesus Christ dies, resurrects, sends us. Go. Make disciples, multiply, of all nations, subdue the earth. Are you with me? What is the church's command? When you stand before Jesus gave this parable of the talents, multiply. And if you're not going to multiply, enable someone who will multiply. And the church gets scared to death of that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because multiplication makes us have to die to ourselves. Because we either go to church to see what the church can do for us, or we are the church. And we go to change the world. So we, looking back at Acts chapter 2, there's this amazing formula of how the early church moved. They had the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations. The method, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Then we look at this amazing formula, Acts 2. You guys read it last week, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You want to make the world see the bride of Christ as beautiful and lovely as she has been? You want the world to see the church like they used to? You want the world to return to the bride of Christ? You want to see real change come? Comes to this secret word right here. This is not really secret, but it's, it's part of the formula, and a lot of people leave it out. It's like a nasty recipe when there's no milk in the brownies. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You know what happens in every single one of these? That's to the church. That's what we do at church. The word church comes from the word ecclesia. It means the assembly. You can't do that on your own. You can't be away from it. And when the church works together and when the church is devoted to the doctrine, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. The only time Jesus' prayer in John 17 for unity in his church so the world would see and believe in his love was answered is right here. It says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That's better than stimulus checks, y'all. I mean, that's God-ordained right there. You ain't even, well, I'm not allowed to talk about Biden. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I just did. All right, so here's the deal. They sold property and they broke bread. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Where did they meet? At church, temple courts. They just were too big for the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and glad with in sincere hearts, praising God. And here's something the church hasn't had in my lifetime. And enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, today, we, we reach a lot of people for Christ, but, but are we devoted to it? Is the whole body devoted to it? You guys have an amazing preacher, and I'm not saying that because he, he brought me here. I drove here. I wouldn't have driven here for anybody. That was a long drive from South Carolina to here. I didn't even know what Kentucky looked like. I thought Kentucky, everything was in one little bubble. Y'all got a long state. <laughs> Y'all need to do something about that. Split it. Like Eastern and Western Kentucky. Just, we have North and South Carolina. We fixed our problem. But the early church, man, in one day grew from 150 people to over 3,000. 
Jesus had led thousands. They had abandoned him. He showed himself to over 500 people. And then by the time he resurrects, the only people that still believe in him is 120. And then after 120 people get done preaching on the day of Pentecost and opening up the church, 3,000 plus people have come. And now they don't even have a temple they can meet in. They're so big. They have to meet in the temple courts. They got to break this sucker up everywhere they go. But here's what they had. They had leadership. They had authority, doctrinal commitment, size, sincerity, generosity, unity, favor, and power. And nothing that they had is not available to us today in that list. We may not be the apostles, but we have more power. We may not be raising the dead, healing the sick. I may not be able to speak in every language from under the sun, but I have the word of God that is sharper than any power that you could ever imagine, and it still can cut to the heart of any person. We have the ability to lift up Jesus Christ in a dying society. One of the things that I want to point out is as things are going good, and the early church has it good right now. I mean, the day of Pentecost was the most dangerous time to preach Jesus. It was the most dangerous place, Jerusalem, and the most dangerous message. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Every part of that was blasphemy to the people in that area. And yet they exploded and nothing happened. And they're meeting, and it's awesome. But growth causes conflict. And the only way you'll continue to grow, the only way you'll continue to make it, is you have to look at the obstacles in your way with zeal. Last night I watched the dumbest pay-per-view fight I've ever seen in my life. But I found out something. As I was watching, I was thinking, there is no athlete that's competing in a fight for a title that goes into it and is like, man, I've trained my whole life for this, and now i got to fight somebody. This is horrible. I don't, what if he hits me in the face? No, it doesn't happen like that. They're ready for the obstacle. They're ready for the battle because they know the belt is on the other side. There's never been a Super Bowl where you've looked and a quarterback has been in the dressing room sitting in the back going, oh, gee, they're gonna, people are going to want to tackle me. They're are going to come after me and I've, I've worked so hard and now I've got to go out there and risk it. It doesn't work like that. When you really long for victory, you long for the battle. The church is the only kingdom with an army in the world that gets a little obstacle in front of it. And it's like, oh no, now it's going to challenge everything. Now we actually have to go and fight. Jesus said, I'll, on this rock, I will build my church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. That was not something saying, I'm just going to protect you and you're going to be safe. He's saying, I'm sending you as a conquering army that is going to pull souls from the very pits of hell. You should long for the battle. Because the battle is nothing that destroys us. The battle is destroying those we've been sent to retrieve. We are what gives hell nightmares. We are the church. We are what makes the demons hear the name of Jesus Christ in his authority, and they shudder at his name. We need to stop being afraid because there are people with microphones and Twitter accounts that can intimidate us, and we need to start stepping up and saying we are the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Can the church amen? All right. So let's look at where the church was facing. I'm pretty bad on time, so... I got to make sure somebody just give me a little flash in the back with a light, with a light. If, somebody, if, if I run out of time, just let me know, okay? Acts 3, verse 1. Let's look at what's going on. All right, the early church has a couple problems with it. All right, first problem with it is they're, they're preaching public enemy number one of the Romans and the, and the Jews. Number one. Next one, they're not a sanctioned religion of Rome, therefore their faith is illegal and it offers no rights or protections. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. If that's important to you, it's important to you. I just want to get you to, these guys are going at the time of prayer because people gather at temples and they want to teach you about Jesus. A man was there, lame from birth, being carried to the temple call, gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going to the temple courts. What's he begging for? He wants money. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for money. You are surrounded in a world with people today, just like the early church, that want money. We have an all-powerful God and salvation we can offer people, but the world, they think they need money. And this guy had been getting money, and every day they sit him there, and guess what? Every day someone has to carry him and sit him there because money just gets him from here to here, and then he starts back at the same place every day. So many times we live for things that the world controls us with. 
Check this out. He's here. He's begging. He saws Peter and John about to enter, and he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. Now, I, I think it's sometimes we're so busy asking for money, we're not even really looking for anything else. We're not even looking. We're just generically throwing out, oh, I need, I need, I want, I want. And that's the world we live in. And sometimes as a church, we actually hear them and what they're asking for, and we don't see what they're needing, and it's so much easier for us to give them the money than to actually stop and look at them and say, look. He said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, gold and silver I do not have, but what I do have I give you. I want us to just take a moment right now, if you're with me. 830 group, we got to set an example for everybody else. Wake up, man. Here we go. Breathe in, breathe deep. You got your mask on, you're safe from COVID. Okay, here's the deal. I want you to think about this. The world is looking to you, even as the church, and they're expecting you to take care of their financial and monetary needs. Sometimes you need to look at the world and say, I'm not giving you money. I'm giving you what I have. And what I have is more valuable. He looks at this man, and he says something. Everybody sees the healing. In South Carolina, I always hear people, they say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And everyone gets excited about the walk part. But the powerful part is where he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I think what people miss here is I'm saying Jesus, the man everybody persecuted. I'm calling him the Christ. And I'm letting you know he was from the ghetto of Nazareth. But in this, walk. Now, the miracle is not the man walking. The miracle is that Jesus Christ has just been magnified in this man's life. The authority of Jesus' name is there. And so as we look at the guy jumps up to his feet, he begins to walk, and then he went up to him in the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God. I'm going to be honest with you, man. I got a lady that goes to our church, and she jumps during the worship service. And I, man, at one point, I thought she was going to do like kung fu and backflips. My instinct was not to sit there and say, I bet she was healed. <laughs> My instinct was not to sit there and say, man, I, I bet that lady, shoo, she must really be excited. My instinct's like, if she jumps one more time and breaks that chair, we just bought them chairs. <laughs> and bro, I, I'm telling the security team, that woman, she's like, wow, they'll be playing music. I'm like, somebody tase her. You know what I mean? In the back, want a dart gun. Sometimes people, sometimes people do it for their own attention. But I do think sometimes we are so reserved that we forget to run and tell people. What Jesus has done for us. Remember the Samaritan lady outside of Samaria and Jesus talks to her. She brought a whole city to Jesus. And in just a short time later, Philip goes there after the res resurrection of Jesus and baptizes that whole town. Why? Because someone was willing to run and tell. Someone was willing to show. See, the opposition here is these guys are standing at the temple teaching something the leaders of the temple have tried to silence. And now they don't have to run into the temple and teach it because a man that the people have watched, the, the religious group of the day have sat and watched hungry and needing every day, sat outside the gate begging, is now running and leaping and proclaiming the name of Jesus. You want to know how you change the opposition? The opposition for them is going to be the religious leaders around them, the same opposition Jesus had. Do you want to know how to change the opposition? Give them something they can't deny. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't raise the dead and I can't make the lame walk. But I tell you what, I have seen God do in my life, and I've seen him do it from church to church in a way that's not deniable. People the rest of the world has given up on. I've watched Jesus turn them around and turn them into ambassadors for his kingdom. I've watched broken families become united pictures of success. I've seen people who were struggling with addiction become those who are now rescuing people from the pits. I've seen people who were labeled with scarlet letters who are now the mentors they're raising up a generation of young ladies. The church brings about undeniable change. Scoffers will always scoff, but you cannot deny when Jesus Christ has changed a life. Check this out. The people start praising. I, I got to make sure I'm low on time and I, I, I'm getting through chapter 3 and 4. And Dave's sitting over there probably sweating right now like he ain't even cracked into chapter 3 yet. <laughs> but we can't miss how this all sets up because to this point, everything is good. 
To this point, everything is amazing. To this point, it's like the early days of a church when we, when we grew or that season where we built or that time where we remodeled and that time where we really did some great stuff and then we finish. Because one of two things are going to happen. The devil's coming one or two ways. The first way he's going to come is going to be persecution. And he'll only persecute you enough to get you comfortable. The other way that we get the devil into our church is that we stop after we finish something and we never start again. And we're that nation that's telling generation after generation after generation that that one time God moved. Instead of being that church that's teaching every generation to expect to see God move and to step forward. So here's what happens, man. They get up, and I'm just going to cut through some of this scripture. Sorry, people in the back. But as he's, as he's standing there, he's like, this wasn't us. This was Jesus. And then they preached the hardest message to preach to the Hebrew people at the temple. Oh, by the way, y'all crucified him. Y'all killed him. He was the son of God. Ironically, same message that 3,000 people responded to earlier. And it's working. Here's the message. Your sin is bad. But Jesus loved you and made a way for you to come out of it. Repent. Change. Stop it. Go back to that method. Make disciples. Can't make disciples if you don't teach them sin's bad. Can't call them out of something if you don't point out what they need to come out of. And you can't call them to something unless you lift up Jesus. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Surely I'll be with you. And I'm going to move down to Acts chapter 4 just as we go through this. Because as we look at Acts chapter 3, they're lifting up a very hard message and people are starting to believe. And it's the good season. But the same corrupt leaders who persecuted Jesus, who paid off soldiers to say that his body was stolen are now in the midst coming up like political people. And I just want you to get this. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 1, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. It's kind of like y'all ever have church service going live on Facebook and something happens, they just take it down. You ever have that happen? Or you got a YouTube video that's going and then they flag you and let you know that there may be something inappropriate here? I'm like, Facebook, you're inappropriate, you know? I mean, it's, it's just that combative nature. So someone comes up and stops them in the middle of their message. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Persecution comes in the midst of success, in the midst of growth, in the midst of victory. Listen, can I share something with you? If you're in a fight, don't think the beginning of the fight or the middle of the fight are the most intense points. It's at the end when someone thinks they're losing. When you are the biggest threat to your enemy, they will fight the most fierce, but they're fighting with the last. Don't give up at this cusp of victory. Don't give up when you're that close. Listen to this. But many who heard their message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So 120 people, just counting men, has gone to over 3,000 and now to over 5,000. Just the people who believe the message. It's through the persecution of the church and the miracles of the apostle that the people believed. They saw the power of the people opposed and they weren't backing down. So they knew in their minds, man, if you're willing to stand and go to jail for this with the power you have, there's got to be something to this. This worked just like the Jesus miracles and the teachings that he had and how he gained attention from people. But it was his sacrifice that showed love. And the sacrifice of love, the willing to suffer for the gospel speaks a lot louder than any miracles that could ever be performed. Next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of law met in Jerusalem I just left this in here for a specific point. Annas, the high priest, was there. Realistically, Annas wasn't the high priest. It was Caiaphas at this time. And so was Caiaphas. That's Annas' son-in-law. And John, Alexander, and the others, the high priest family. So the high priest position by God was Levitical, but at this point, it's political. So at this point, instead of it being a biblical office that's set up by God, these guys are politicians that hold a position that Rome gives them the authority over. 
No, they don't care about the church, and they don't care about God. They care about the power of being the high priest. Ironically, in our world today, this may sound offensive, but a lot of times the churches don't care about the loss. They care about maintaining the program. And I know right now everybody's head's like, yeah, you know those big, big churches, man, it's a program. They don't care about people. The people are just about numbers and dollars. You know what's more scary than that to me? The churches that reach a comfortable size and stay there and aren't concerned about the lost. I would rather see the gospel lifted up by crooked mouths than the gospel contained by content people. At least if Jesus is lifted up, he said he'll draw men unto himself. But if he's not lifted up, how will people know? Check this out. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. By what power and what name did you do this? And I love how Peter steps up right here. Because Jesus had told him, when you stand trial in front of the religious leaders, when you're before the Sanhedrin, don't worry, my Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. This specific prophecy Jesus made happens right here. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, we have no problem, this is our Twitter post. This is our, man, you want my status? If you're mad at me today because I love somebody who was crippled that sat outside your house day after day with nothing but chump change, and today the man is walking, if you really want an account on this, I'm gonna tell you, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. You want to know by what authority we did this? It's Jesus. Listen to what he says. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Listen, we fear people calling us to account for our faith. There is never a time you're going to stand trial that you've not been given a megaphone to be able to speak Jesus. And no, it's opposition, and it's scary, and it's intimidating. We're like, man, I, I don't know if, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't like people coming at me. I don't like conflict. I don't like struggle. I don't like hell. I'm going to tell you, man, I don't, I don't like the thought that people will go to hell. And so, yeah, I don't like conflict. I don't like strife. I don't like when the media or someone on social media decides to come against the church. But I do take every opportunity, if they're going to give me free press, If they're going to give me attention, then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to lift up Jesus. And this is opposition in the church's face right now. How do we respond? What do we do? And he says, you crucified Jesus. He's the stone that prophecy said you builders would reject. But it's through him these miracles are happening. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no there is no one other than there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This message is only offensive to people that don't want to be saved. Because anybody that was perishing at this point that heard salvation was possible would have been like, whoa, (laughs) praise God, let's go. But for people that don't care about salvation, that want to maintain their lifestyle, everything we've talked about this morning would be offensive because it's uncomfortable. Victory is uncomfortable. Growth is uncomfortable. World change is uncomfortable. Sinners coming to Christ is uncomfortable. Messy people are uncomfortable. Thank God there's no sinners or messy people in this room. I actually wear one of y'all's shirts all the time. My message. It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. I've used that so many times. But we're messy. We're messy. Doesn't mean we don't love each other, right? Everybody in this room is not not GQ worthy. Everybody in this room is not the most beautiful person in the world. Everybody doesn't have luxurious hair. Everybody can't have a magnificent beard. But it doesn't stop us. My children, I love my children, but I've wiped every one of their butts. You know what I mean? And that's messy, and it's gross, and it's nasty, but I love them, and they've grown. And, and only some of them still have that problem. But we're praying them through it, right? We don't give up. We're in it for the long haul. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were, check this out, messy church, can y'all, can y'all just be with me for a second, 8.30 service, can we muster the last of it here? When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. Mm. I'm with you. 
That's okay. Me, me and that baby right there. I feel your plight. But the issue is unschooled, ordinary people to a world that's educated by fools. When the whole world's educated by fools and you're uneducated, you're smart. Check this out. And it says they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. They took note these men had been with Jesus. Oh, that's our nemesis. We couldn't get him. We couldn't lock him. We couldn't stop him. We couldn't silence him. These guys have been trained by him. It's like fighting Jesus. Listen, if the world is coming against you, stop fighting as you and start letting Jesus fight for you. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto myself. So quit trying to engage in the battle and start lifting up Jesus and letting him win. Since they could not see the man, or since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing to say. Let me say this, church. Keep the messy people with you because as they change, the world has a hard time throwing stones at changed people. They called him in again, commanding him not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Remember the early church? They had the favor of God and the favor of people. They've gone through the good part. They've gone through the persecution. But because they faced it, because they've gone through the obstacle, now all the people are praising God for what had happened for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Listen, if the church really does its job, we become the majority, and they can't silence the majority. we got to be loud. And I'm not saying we got to be boisterous and we got to be aggressive and we got to be angry and we got to go out and start yelling and marching. What I'm saying is you'll never change the world by marching in the streets. You'll change the world by going to one person at a time and winning them to Jesus. You don't change the world by going out and vocalizing your, your, your upset nature about how the world has gotten. If I hear one more person talk about in my day, your day's the reason we are here now. In your day, if you had protected the church and taught the church to go forward and not sat back and bragged about your mama's day and granddaddy's day so much, we wouldn't be where we are now. This generation, every generation, we have further and further gotten to a point of, you know, in my day, in my day, forget your day. Today is your day. Today is the day of the Lord. Quit living for the past and start living for the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Our commission is to build the church. If I hear one more person look at me and say, you know, the church in my day, I'll be like, man, the church, in what, are you, what are you, the Old Testament? <laughs> We're the book of Acts, man. It's time to be the church today. And quit complaining about the bride of Christ. Quit talking trash about the bride of Christ. Okay, she's wearing sweatpants. She ain't washed her hair in a little while. But he still loves her. Bro, let's get her to the spa, get her looking good, and present her to him again fresh. The bride can... Y'all didn't get that one, did you? Man, I was all excited. Some of y'all sitting there like, don't say that in front of my wife. Okay. <laughs> These guys, I'm going to skip down again. These guys go and they start praying. They, go, they brag. Man, we got persecuted. And this happens throughout the early church. They brag when they're persecuted and they go back and they pray. And you know what they do? They remind themselves that, God, nobody's ever been able to come against you or your church that you've not allowed because you had victory lined up. And so we accept that victory. That's pretty much the prayer. They, they, they remind themselves through prayer of how God has always been victorious and has a plan. And it says, verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Don't stop them. Give us great boldness. Don't stop the persecution. Give us great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Give us ways to lift up Jesus the world can't deny. After they prayed, a place, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I always hear people like, oh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in South Carolina, we got a lot of tongue talkers and stuff. And everybody's like, oh, and they started talking in tongues. You really want to look at when the Spirit's present? Same place in Acts 2, same place in Acts 4. I want to show you this. The proof of the Holy Spirit filling a place is the people step out boldly and lift up Jesus Christ. The tongues was a method to reach all the nations that were gathered in Acts 2. But in Acts 4, it's the boldness that changes the world. 
is what the Holy Spirit enables people to do. Check this out. What if we could shake this place today? What if Shelby was shaken? What if, what if Shelbyville was changed by Shelby Christian? It's already happening, but what if the 830 service could lead the charge? If we could set the pace for those puny 10 o'clock worshipers, you know what I mean? Those guys who just barely made it out of bed this morning. And then the 1130 sluggards. It could. Because if the people were moved, the Holy Spirit is ready. The world is primed for change. But Jesus has to be lifted up. Let me close with this. Verse 32, and all the believers, there's the unity again, were of one heart and mind. Same place we started. They went through the opposition, and now they've grown by over 2,000 people, and they found the unity again. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared in everything they'd had. They're just as generous, and this, this season of just generosity that's going to reach people expands and goes greater than ever before. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. The people were still marveling over what the apostles were doing. And God's grace was so powerful at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Listen, I, I, I'm going to call Dave up to close this. But I, I got to say this before I leave, just in case this last part doesn't get me the approval to speak at 10. Are you ready? We're all going to stand before God. And we're going to see Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we're going to be his servants there, bow before his throne. Are we going to be the generation that stood up, that believed the obstacles in front of us were opportunities for victory? Are we going to be those that were afraid that wrapped the kingdom and put it in the ground? Are we going to look at our obstacles and see this is a chance to be able to flex the power of Jesus Christ? Are we going to be the generation that actually believes what it is for Jesus to have all authority in heaven and on earth? Because I'll be honest, the world is pretty good at scaring us. And they've, they've convinced us through the media and through television and through radio and social media and through every format, they've, they've really scared us good. And 42% of the churches in America are not going to reopen after COVID. That's the statistics. Look it up from Barna Research. And the church is saying nothing about it. And the rest, of the, the rest of the preachers and people are coming together saying we're just defeated. And they're calling us a post-Christian generation. Everyone that is between the age of 22 and 13. A full-on post-Christian generation. That's an obstacle. It's not the end. Right now, church, we are facing some crazy statistics. And we've got some manipulation. We've got some people out there that are trying to stop us. But no one tries to stop you if they're not intimidated of you. The devil doesn't attack you if you're not at the cusp of victory. And right now, COVID has scared people to death. But I'm going to tell you something. We can bring our church and the people back from the brink of this crippling death where we sit around and beg for stimulus checks and where we sit around waiting on the church to take care of us without acknowledging the bride's power. Church, it's time to resurrect. Church, it's time to be healed. It's time to get up out of our rags and step up in the name of Jesus Christ and show this world we're not dead. We're not tapping out, and we're not giving up. That's all I got. So we sing this song. Maybe today that just kind of... Mm, mm. Maybe you've never made Jesus Lord of your life like Bella did. So we sing this last song. Jason's going to be down here. Bradley's down here. Kim's down here. T-Rob's down here. we got folks that would love to talk to you about what it means to make Jesus Christ Lord in your life. Maybe you just need to, and we've been saying this every week for a few months now. Maybe, maybe you've already made that decision, especially a lot of you all already made that decision. Maybe you don't need to sing this song. Maybe you need to pray and beg and say, just help me be bold. Maybe you need to drop to your knees at your seat. Maybe you need to come down front and kneel and just say, God, I want to get real about this because 
I'm tired of obstacles getting in the way of people I love coming to know Jesus. Whatever you need to do, let's get it right with Jesus while we sing this song. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be changed. about it, church. Hey, if this is the first Sunday uh, you've chosen to worship with us, man, what a Sunday you picked. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. But here's the deal. We got a gift for you. There's a big orange wall out in the lobby. You can't miss the big white letters. I'm new. Brett and his team got a gift for you out there. Stop by and see them. If you've been here a while and you're trying to figure out what your next step is, you want to sign up for the next Pathways, which is May the 11th. Uh, you can go straight through that door. You can go around the lobby, come in the next step room. Some folks will hook you up out there. Now here, I got a challenge. Here's what you need to do right now. Because you've been here, right? You've, you've been here. Here's what you need to do right now. Who's your one? Who's your one? Here's my challenge. You need to get out of here, go to their house, and pick them up and come back and do it all over again. And if you can't get them, you need to call them and tell them they better get online at 10 o'clock or 1130, that there's something they need to see in here. All right? Man, thanks for being here, guys. Let's go change the world. We'll see you next week.